it's not always safe to be uncharitable to disagree with the introduction that's made to you in the talk, but I should say my book, the new book's called The End of Lawyers? Question mark. And the question mark's all important there, otherwise I'd be the end of my consulting career exclamation mark. I want to cover eight subjects with you today. I want to talk a, a little bit about the future, how to think about the future, the kind of mindset that might be useful for you to have in thinking of the future of the legal market, talk about the market itself, turn to the vital concept uh, of uh, commoditization, it's a vital word at least, but it's a vital concept, speak about information technology, which in many ways has been my passion over the last 25 years or so, how it would impact in the, the legal world. I want to suggest to you that the shape of law firms is changing and reflect on what that new shape might look like. Say a little bit about access to justice and how it can be enabled and increased through information technology and other techniques. And ultimately say something about whether or not lawyers actually do have a future, hence the question mark. And finally comment on law schools and what their role might be in the new world as I envisage it. So let's start off with the future and with the tale of Black & Decker, one of the world's leading manufacturers of power tools. It's said that Black & Decker, when they recruit new executives, they take them off on a course. And they sit them in a room, I suspect, not much like this, but they put a slide up exactly like the one behind me, and say to the assembled executives, this is what we sell, isn't it? And the new executives look rather surprised by this. They say, of course, that's what we sell. We're Black & Decker. We're leading manufacturers of power tools. The trainers say with some satisfaction, this is not what we sell because this is not actually what our customers want. This, they say, is what our customers want. And it's your job to find ever more competitive and imaginative and creative ways of giving our customers what they want. And I think there's a marvelous lesson here for lawyers everywhere who are thinking about the future. Because lawyers tend to be a power drill mentality. They tend to think, well, what do we do today? And broadly that one-to-one -one consultative advisory service delivered through documents and meetings and often on an hour to billing basis. And think, how can we streamline that? How can we improve upon it? Not often enough, I argue, do lawyers take a step back and think, what actually are we doing in life? Why is it that major or minor organizations pay large amounts of money for our services? What is it that we actually, by way of value, add to the world in which we live? What is the hole in the wall for lawyers? It's a question I've been asking for 15 years. And I found two answers to that question, not directly, but two answers that I think you might find useful. The first is from KPMG. And if you look at KPMG, certainly at one stage, their global mission statement ran something like this. KPMG said, we exist to turn our knowledge into value for the benefit of our clients. We exist to turn our knowledge into value for the benefit of our clients. Isn't that a superb way of capturing what we all do as professional advisors or for people who aspire to being lawyers? We have knowledge, we have expertise, we have insight, we have experience and ideas which we apply in our client's circumstances. That's what we do as lawyers. The premise here, of course, is that we're not necessarily in the business of delivering our knowledge in a different way. KPMG don't say we exist to provide one-to-one -one consultative advisory services on an hourly billing basis. What they say is that we exist to transfer our knowledge. And my argument is this, if knowledge management or knowledge is the volume, the whole of the wall in the legal world, we have a couple of options. We can be rigorous and systematic about the way we capture and nurture and reuse our knowledge, or we can be haphazard and unstructured and unsystematic. And the latter is how we are generally going about our manipulation of knowledge in the legal world. The fundamental point here is, though, that clients are not after one-to-one -one advisory service. The way we currently work as lawyers, lawyers are after something more fundamental, and that's to tap into the knowledge and experience of lawyers. The strategic challenge, therefore, is are there different, new, better, quicker, cheaper, less costly, less forbidding ways of delivering our knowledge? That's the challenge the profession faces. Another response to what the hole in the wall is in the legal world comes directly from clients. I do a great deal of work, research, with general counsel, senior in-house lawyers within companies, and they say to me again and again one thing. They say this, that law firms are far too reactive. They simply wait to respond to our instructions to them. They don't anticipate our needs. Clients, general counsel, say to me, we're not really in the business of dispute resolution. We don't want dispute resolution. We want dispute avoidance. We don't want legal problem solving, we want legal risk management. 
Or to put it more graphically, what clients tell me is they would prefer a fence at the top of the cliff rather than an ambulance at the bottom. And a great deal of legal service, as is being improved today, is about equipping that ambulance a little bit better or getting that ambulance to the scene of the, the problem a little bit quicker. Which is, clients say to me, to miss the point. The help clients want is at the top of the cliff. Senior lawyers within major businesses want to avoid problems. They want to anticipate problems. They want to identify risks and control risks. And if ever the legal profession has fallen short, it's in this area. Every in-house counsel I interview will say to me, I'm in the business of legal risk management, and hardly a law firm in the world provides the kinds of proactive legal risk management services that these clients are actually wanting. So just to recap, the hole in the wall, I'm arguing, is two things. Why the market sustains lawyers, the value lawyers bring, it seems to me, is twofold. Because lawyers have knowledge, expertise, insight, the clients don't have. And secondly, looking more to the future, because lawyers potentially can help clients avoid legal problems and not just resolve them. Let me say a little about automation and innovation. When most people think about information technology and its impact, not just in law, but generally, they tend to have automation in mind, which is taking some kind of process or task or activity, computerizing it, systematizing it, streamlining, optimizing, all these kinds of words one hears. The fundamental point here being that that to which the, com the computer technology, the information technology is applied, exists, it pre-exists, and somehow technology improves the position. Now you can look at marvelous examples in law and elsewhere of, of the use of automation. But if I look at other sectors that have done right across the world, the most dramatic and impressive applications of information technology are not actually instances of automation at all. The instances of what I call innovation. And innovation, in my terms at least, is using information technology to allow you to do things that previously weren't possible. That's the real excitement of technology. Because in so many law firms, despite what people think, many of the processes are actually already quite efficient. The work is already done to a high standard. The scope for simple automation is quite limited. The excitement for me of the information technology in the legal world is allowing us to do different and new things that weren't possible when it was only manual techniques at our fingertips. Now, many people are very dismissive of this. They say, Richard, how on earth computer, com computer technology ever give rise to innovation? And I use this information technology as an example, the ATM, one of the most successful information technologies of the last 30 or 40 years. Now, if you're of an automation mindset, that's to say, if you think information technology can do nothing else than computerize something that already exists, I put down this challenge. What did that computerize? What pre-existing process did that systematize? Was it the case that 30 years ago, in the middle of the night, when you needed money, you went down to the local bank and there was a large hole in the wall of the bank? And some poor bank teller sitting on the other side, he bent down and said, could I have $50, please? And out came a hand clutching the notes you required. Of course not. It wasn't that that process existed. And some bankers got around the table and said, come on, chaps, this is rather inefficient and often quite chilly. Why don't we do it differently? Of course not. It was that information technology gave rise to a fundamentally new way of delivering the domestic banking service. And so too in law. The challenge is not simply to say, how do we work today as lawyers and how can we streamline that through technology? The challenge is to think, how can we change the way lawyers work? How can we work differently using information technology? So much about the future and the mindset one might usefully have. Let's talk about the market. And for me, the market actually can be quite, sim quite simply summarized. And this is, again, feedback I'm getting unanimously from the senior in-house lawyers with whom I consult with and with whom I do research. And it seems to me you can summarize the current state of the market in this way. I think major clients face a dilemma in three parts. The first part is that you will find every in-house lawyer, almost without exception, under pressure to reduce their internal headcount. Companies in these difficult economic times are simply saying, we have to make cuts across the board, and the legal function is no exception. So there's pressure on in-house lawyers to reduce internal headcount. At the same time, and vitally for law firms, there's huge pressure on internal lawyers, on general counsel, to reduce the amount they spend on external law firms. This is unarguable. This is just coming back 90, 95% of the, the uh, in-house lawyers with whom I speak. And at the same time, and this is very much an and yet, 
What they're also saying to me is they've got more legal and compliance work to do than ever before, and much of it's riskier. Now, all of this should resonate. The economy is tragic, less resource for internal laws, less to spend in external law firms, more regulation coming through, more difficult legal situations. And it seems to me we can see that something has to give. We cannot continue working this way, because it's also the other fact that, at least until this year, almost every year, lawyers were putting up their fees every year. I summarize this by saying clients want more for less. And I, I think this is just the phrase that captures the spirit of the, the meetings I have with the client community. And so the governments, incidentally, in relation to uh, services that are supported by the public legal aid. There's another thing in England that's relevant that I think will have a ripple effect across the global community, and that's the possibility of external investment in legal businesses. Under the Legal Services Act 2007 in England, it will now soon be possible in not not as much even, I think it's two years, the date's not quite certain. But it will now soon be possible for external investment to be made in law firms. Private equity, venture capital. It will be possible for non-lawyers to be partners in law firms. It will be possible for non-lawyers to hold the top management positions within law firms. This will radically change, it seems to me, the way at least some legal businesses operate. And many people say, well, that's not relevant for the US because we don't have that kind of provision. But I think it might be. Because what you'll see is a number of private equity houses, venture capitalists, other external investors, imaginative new managers from different disciplines, coming in and showing that legal services can be delivered for different wage, showing that disputes can be resolved uh, at less cost, perhaps less confrontation, showing that deals can be managed more effectively, showing that advice can be delivered more quickly and painlessly. And the point is not whether or not external investment is limited to the English legal system, the point is will new business models, new ways of delivering legal services emerge from these investments in England? And I, I'm involved with a, a board, an advisory board member of a private equity firm that's investing in the legal market and I'm learning a huge amount from this. But the chances of these external investors taking an existing law firm and tweaking it a bit are almost non-existent. They'll be, they're not committed to hourly billing or pyramidic structures and expensive buildings and expensive cities. They think of it entirely new ways of delivering legal services. And whether or not that's restricted to England in terms of external investment, in a sense the genie will be out of the bottle. It will be seen that legal services might be delivered in different ways. But let's go back to the more for less theme, because it's the underpinning theme of my talk today. Clients require more for less. I think there are only two broad strategies that law firms and their clients can adopt in responding to this. I call these the efficiency strategy and the collaboration strategy. The efficiency strategy intuitively is what one might think. One needs to cut the costs of legal service. If you need more for less, how do we take some of the costs out of legal service? Now the important point here is this is not simply asking law firms to reduce the number of support staff or maybe uh, cut the marketing budget a little. This is about the cost of legal service, the cost of lawyers delivering advice, handling deals, resolving disputes. The reality is it's too costly today for most organizations to afford. A lot of this, and it's a running theme again of what I've got to say, is that routine and repetitive legal world uh, work, the legal world over, is being undertaken by quite junior lawyers at very high costs. And so the challenge of the efficiency strategy is how do we take some of the costs out of the routine and repetitive work in the legal market? This takes me along a path towards what I call commoditization. I'll turn to that in a few minutes. And it also leads me to a notion that I've uh, termed multi-sourcing. <clears throat> That's the intuitive and obvious one. We need more for less, we have to cut the cost of legal service. The more ambitious and radical strategy is what I call the collaboration strategy. And this is the idea that clients not, don't simply cut costs, but actually share the costs. And the premise here is that many legal clients the world over again actually have similar legal problems. And isn't there some way that they can club together and share the costs of, say, a regulatory review or share the costs of some kind of drafting activities, or share the costs of some kind of investigation that they all are monitoring, that they're all conducting uh, at the same time. So a huge amount of regulation coming through. How does one actually master that? How does one put in place procedures? Common challenges across many businesses. What I'm suggesting, and frankly this is not science fiction, uh, last year I was working with a, with a half a dozen general counsel that actually Fortune 50 company, that kind of side, who are thinking of this precisely. They share common legal tasks, 
they're not competitive, why can't we share the costs here? And I believe this will be enabled and fueled through emerging technologies, broadly web 2.0 te uh, technologies, online community, harnessing the collaboration power of technology. So this in a nutshell is what I see uh, the profession has to do to meet the more for less challenge. We either have to cut the cost of legal service and or we have to find convenient ways of clients to share the cost of legal service. So let's really take the first one and talk about commoditization. I'm conscious, uh, in, in my new book I use this term bespoke, I'm conscious I know, uh, that now that bespoke is not a term that's particularly well used in, in North America. If you came to London, however, and you had the money, unlikely in this particular climate, to have a handmade suit made in Savile Row, we in England would call that a bespoke suit. Or if you came to England to have software developed for you, it's not clear why one would choose to do that, uh, in, 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 in this current climate. But again, if it was developed specifically for you and wasn't uh, off the shelf, we'd call that bespoke software. And I believe by analogy, a lot of legal work is highly bespoke. And one of the, I think, great tragedies of law school, not just here, just all over the world, is we are, I think, encouraged to regard almost all legal problems as requiring bespoke solutions. We're encouraged to think of almost all legal difficulties as though they might reach, in your case, the Supreme Court, or in my case, the House of Lords. But the reality is huge amounts of legal work do not involve the starting with a blank sheet of paper. And in, a, in a, the bespoke solution, um, or the bespoke approach, when you're drafting an agreement, you start with a blank sheet of paper and you craft it from scratch. But a great deal of legal work isn't like that at all. A great deal of legal work's routine and repetitive. And what do we do with that? Well, it seems to me, standardized, and I'll touch that in a second. But right at the other end of the spectrum, there's something called commoditization. And most lawyers who talk about commoditization, if they're prepared to uh, allow the words in their mouths, will tend to say it simultaneously with a dismissive wave of the right hand, which means, fundamentally, we can't make money out of that anymore. The commoditization of legal services suggests that, and uh, it's, a, it's a filthy concept, that some legal work is actually just so commonplace, so simple for the lawyer, that in some way we can make that available as a commonplace, really available, and uh, not just widely available, but available at no cost at all. And that's the idea of commoditizing. And the mindset often of many practitioners when they're thinking of the future of legal services is to think, well, either it's one or two. It's either we handcraft or it's this bespoke stuff. So I'm going to stay the bespoke end. And I argue it's far more sophisticated than that. And in fact, there's a spectrum we can see of bespoke that leads to commoditization of legal services. And the red line there is, uh, is for lawyers amongst you who, uh, who are concerned with the profitability of law firms, because you don't actually want to move across that final uh, red line if you're a lawyer. If you're a client, that's where you want to be. But let me talk you through each stage. As I say, very often when works routine or repetitive, we don't approach it in a bespoke, a customized, a highly tailored way. We standardize. We standardize in two ways. We standardize in terms of process, and we standardize in terms of substance. In terms of process, we use checklists, we use procedure manuals. If you're in the consulting world, you'll use methodologies. But basically, we articulate, we are pre-articulate the steps that, that we need to, to walk through to undertake a particular piece of work. We don't think it out from scratch. And in terms of documents, in terms of substance, we don't, as it happens, start with a blank sheet of paper. We might use templates or standard form documents, or we might use previously negotiated agreements. But we usually have something to start with. And that's what we call standardization. Now, many law firms don't stop there. They move to the systematization. So let's use a concrete example. Um, the drafting of employment contracts, for example. Historically, perhaps, done as a handcrafted bespoke service. Firms that do a lot of that kind of work would seek to standardize and have their standard forms for different categories of employees in different circumstances. But then they might go for further and think, well, why don't we systematize? And we're having a discussion this morning and having a further one this afternoon at the Berkman Center about automatic document assembly, a technology that's been around at least since the early 70s. But the idea there is rather than metaphorically or actually cutting and pasting from an original document to create a new one, you simply answer a series of questions on the screen. And high oversimplification here, but hiding behind that screen that asks the question is like a decision tree with standard bits of text hanging off each of the leaves. So if you answer question A in this way, insert it as that paragraph, if you answer that question in that way, in goes this particular clause. And automatically is assemble a pretty polished first draft. Technology is well established. If you speak to business people, with no insight particularly into law, but know about efficiency of process, 
They'll think intuitively, well, of course that must be the case. It cannot be that every piece of legal work out there is so unique that one needs to start afresh. Surely we can bring together past uh, legal clauses, words, phrases, documents, and so forth. So we systematize, and we also might use automatic workflow to carry legal processes efficiently through an organization. We didn't stop there, though. This law firm that I'm suggesting that is automatically generating employment contracts for, for clients might go a step further. They might actually package their knowledge and experience and actually provide that software, essentially, to HR department, to personnel specialists within client organizations. Because so clients will say, if you're actually using quite junior uh, lawyers to answer the questions, why can't we answer the questions? And this is a huge step. This is the taking of your knowledge of the law firm and packaging it, essentially licensing it for clients to use. For many lawyers, I've gone a step too far in suggesting this. But let's go back to KPMG. We exist to turn our knowledge into value for the benefit of our clients. Why shouldn't we, if we can see we can both improve productivity and perhaps reduce costs for clients and increase our own profitability, take the step of packaging? My biggest client over the last decade has been Deloitte, their tax practice in the UK, and they're happy for me to talk about this project. They have gone in the process of tax compliance from what used to be a highly handcrafted process right to the stage of packaging. The compliance process, every company in innumerable jurisdictions has to take information from their accounting system, they have to apply the relevant tax rules, they have to produce documentation in a prescribed form, they have to submit that to the tax authority. As I say, it used to be handcrafted. Before Deloitte, in fact, uh, it was Anderson in the UK um, who developed the system. They went from bespoke to standardized, where they had procedures and standard documents and, and, and formats and so forth. Then spreadsheet technology came along and they began to systematize. And then they built a highly impressive tool embodying many experts inside that essentially would suck the information out, process it, produce a report in a form that could be submitted to the taxing authorities. They used that internally. A number of Anderson people left Anderson to work in companies and came back to the firm and said, we'd like to be able to use that software we used to use when we were working within you. Can we? Choose strategic decisions. On the one hand, some people say we shouldn't give away our crown jewels. On the other hand, people think, yeah, actually, hang on a second, this is a new business model. Why don't we actually license our knowledge? And that, way, that actually uh, was the, the approach they took. And now they make money while they sleep, as I say. 70 out of the FTSE, the top 100 companies in the UK, license that, that knowledge of delight. Don't think of it as software. Don't think of it as something purely process-based. It's a rich, sophisticated body of many hundreds of tax experts that, that clients can now tap into without direct consultation with them. The process is cheaper and quicker and easier for them, and the lawyers are making serious money out of that. Not only that, they have an kind of electronic presence within their client organizations. If you look at firms like Linklater's and Allen and Overy uh, in London, both these firms, and they're amongst the, the largest and most successful global law firms, have produced term sheet generators. What are term sheets? Term sheets very broadly speaking, are the documents that indicate from a financial institution of the condition under which they're, at this stage, thinking they'll make finance available. They're often the basis of later loan documentation. Term sheets, by and large, drafted by banks, not drafted to the quality that specialist banking and finance lawyers would, uh, would do. The problem is that many, many deals never actually come to fruition, and so they can't afford most banks to give the term sheet work to law firms. So what do these firms do? They actually produce an automatic term sheet generator. <coughs> so clients, people in the banks, and the answer to the question, out comes a fairly polished first draft. That's packaging. <clears throat> For me, the final stage of inspection is the commoditization. And one of the things, I'm going to be careful with this term commoditization. Because it is, of course, a metaphor. Because when we're thinking in the physical world of commodities, we're thinking of sugar or silver or coal or whatever it is, often undifferentiated other than the issue of price, but a commonplace. Uh, a commodity is something that can be traded. So I believe the analogy in the information world, and that's the, the world of law is the information world, not physical commodities, is online service. And eventually what one will see, and this is very interesting if you look at uh, um, the Alan Rover and Linklater's model, the difficulty when you've got more than one law firm or provider providing an information product, the price tends very quickly towards zero. 
there's no, the marginal cost of producing that service, that offering to another client is very low, and you'll just, just the economics of the information world is such that when you have competing undifferentiable products or offering or packages in my term, they become commodity. So this is the idea, broadly speaking, that actually, and it would be the same in employment contracts. If another firm were in a similar suite of employment contract offering the same system that were packaged, again, when there's more than one available, the price goes quickly down. So the fight, as it were, if you're commercially minded and a law firm, is to have features in your system which differ from others so you can continue to have it as a, as a sustainable or profitable package. Billing models change across the spectrum. To the left, by and large, when it's bespoke and standardized work, it's dominated by hourly billing. When it's fixed fee work, you'll find there's a lot of systematization and packaging involved. Um, hourly billing, quick anecdote about my daughter at the time the story was 12. One summer, she wanted a summer job, and I asked her to put all my business cards into Outlook. And we discussed how we would do that, and I showed her how to do it, and she said, how much are you going to pay me? And I said, I thought I'd pay you by the hour, when she's 12, and she thinks of this for three seconds and smiles and says, well, I'll take my time then. Now, it seems to me, if, uh, <laughs> if a 12-year-old can see the fundamental problem of hourly billing, why is not one of the most venerated professions in history not seen similarly? Frankly, when I'm retaining lawyers uh, in, in, in various capacities that involve the lawyers, I don't want to give out an open check. I actually want to contain the prices. There are a very limited number of circumstances where I can see hourly billing Defendable. Otherwise, fixed fees for most clients just increasingly make sense. And so when you move from left to right, it, you move from hourly billing to fixed fees. But what do law firms say about this? Well, the average managing partner of a law firm, if he or she has a red marker to hand, will put a red ring around the spoke and say this. Our firm does mainly bespoke work, and that's how it should be. And I say two things to, to that. I say, A, that's factually incorrect, and B, it's strategically misconceived. Well, I don't actually say it in that way, but that's the, the, the thrust of my uh, response. It's actually incorrect, because I can take you to innumerable world-class firms that, of course, have gone well beyond bespoke. They're already standardizing and systematizing. In fact, more than that, the reason clients often choose one law firm over another is precisely because that law firm has good experience in a particular area of law. The idea that the work comes in and thinking, gosh, we've never done one of these before, and we'll be starting from scratch, would be horrific for many clients. So I can take you, as I say, to innumerable firms where standardization and systematization is commonplace. The more important point, why is it strategically misconceived? Well, because what I'm finding when I speak to clients about this is there's a very strong pull from left to right. Now, why would that be? Why are clients wanting to move from left to right? Well, just before I go on to explain that, I just want to say we have to rethink client work for a second. What I'm not saying is you take any dealer dispute and you think into which one of these boxes does it sit. What I'm saying is, and I'll say a little more about this in a second, you can decompose legal work, you can break it down into particular chunks, and each of these chunks, of each of these chunks you can ask the question, into which of these particular boxes does it fit. So don't think of laws or legal services as monolithic lumps of work to be done. You can identify some tasks within almost any legal project and some work needs to be done in a small way, but other work can be done in different ways. Now, with that said, why clients move or want to move from left to right is quite simple. Three, three reasons. One is you move from left to right, the price goes down. Secondly, as you move from left to right, the, the cost becomes more predictable. You move from hard ability to fix speed. And thirdly, and this might surprise you, as you move from left to right, it's, if you get it right, the quality goes up. Because in the left, you might be benefiting from one extremely expert person who can handcraft a solution, but you take the Deloitte example, their package is actually the distillation of the collective experience of many experts. So it's not just one expert as you move from left to right, it's many experts. Now if you're a client and you hear the price goes down, the price becomes more certain, and the quality goes up, you can see why clients might want to pull from left to right. To give you a sense of where I think the legal market at major firms are in the United Kingdom just now, I think we see that kind of spread. Three years time, I think you'll see an emphasis change. This is very approximate, um, but just gives you a flavor of how I think the emphasis will change. Within seven years, it'll look like that, fairly even division right across each area, and within 10 years, I think it will look like that. That's a transformed legal services market. We enabled by a whole bundle of technologies in a whole different set of ways, but I think over the next decade, we will see some pretty clear transformation. 
I call this incremental transformation. It doesn't happen overnight. Decomposing and multi-sourcing. I've hinted at this. What I'm saying is that legal matters aren't indivisible blocks of stuff. You can actually break down, break down any dealer dispute into constituent tasks, and you can allocate each of these tasks along the spectrum I presented to you. And then you can think of each of these tasks. What's the best way to source that? What's the best way to resource that individual piece of work? And what I'm saying is, and I know this might sound terribly unusual, but actually legal service might become a bit like producing a manufacturing of a computer or, or a car, that we know all the various components come from various places and we pull them together. And what I'm saying is there are many different ways you can source legal work. So just, uh, you see 12 before you, let's just take a couple of them. There's the idea now of outsourcing legal work. It might be, for example, document review and litigation. Why should that be done by expensive junior lawyers in expensive cities, where in India there are very bright law graduates who can actually undertake that review at a fraction of the price? Or what about subcontracting? I know many leading firms who are now subcontracting legal work to English qualified lawyers in other jurisdictions, in New Zealand, in South Africa, and elsewhere. Or what about the leasing of lawyers? Yesterday, I had the good fortune uh, to hold a seminar with the chief executive and founder of a firm called Axiom. You may have heard of Axiom. They're a, they're a firm that essentially leases lawyers. Uh, what they do, what they have in mind, is the general counsel, the in-house legal department, that has a steady amount of work. And when a peak arrives, that in-house legal department requires external legal expertise. The conventional law firm will deliver it on an hourly billing basis, very high cost. What essentially Axiom and many other firms are beginning to do, what they actually do is lease a lawyer in, they'll contract a lawyer. It's like a very upmarket temp agency at a fraction of the price. What I'm saying here, whether it be outsourcing or offshoring or computerizing or home sourcing or leasing, there are new ways of handling routine and repetitive work ways that will actually greatly reduce the cost of legal service. And what will happen in a big dealer dispute is you'll chunk it up into constituent tasks, you'll farm the tasks out to the most efficient source uh, that can actually meet each of these tasks, you'll pull them all together, and then you'll deliver it as an integrating service. It's an interesting job there for someone, which is to do the analysis of the constituent tasks, to do the allocating, to do the quality control, to brand, and actually to, in, in some sense, ensure the quality. Will that be law firms, or will that be in-house lawyers, or will that be external project managers? We don't know yet. Let's talk about technology in many ways, uh, as, a, as a guest of the Berkman Centre, it's appropriate that I do so. Lawyers, by and large, and there are, of course, exceptions, but lawyers, by and large, are not tremendously excited about information technology. And I find a tendency amongst many leading lawyers really to think this, that they've got their, their Blackberry machines, they've got Google, but as far as legal work is concerned, that's probably just about the end of the road. We're not going to see fundamental transformation to the nature of legal service. Uh, now, just to take a step back, in, in, in 1996, I wrote a book called The Future of Law. And in The Future of Law, and in the presentations I was giving around that time, I was explaining the great potential of email. Now, this sounds absurd now. But I was claiming that the dominant way that clients and their lawyers would communicate in the future would be by email. And I kid you not, there were senior people in the English legal profession saying that I shouldn't be allowed to speak in public. That, that might be true, actually. But they were saying that I didn't understand safe security, I didn't understand confidentiality, that lawyers would never give up paper in communicating with clients. And in a very small number of years, that had changed radically. So some of my suggestions today seem slightly outlandish. They're not nearly as outlandish as the idea in 96 that lawyers and clients would email one another. But nonetheless, what you'll find is a kind of rationalization amongst lawyers that, okay, I accept my communication habits, being entirely transformed through email. I concede that my information seeking habits have been revolutionized by the World Wide Web, but legal service itself will, will be untouched by technology. And in any event, as the, the internet's had its day, hasn't it? It's, it's, uh, isn't it just tailing off a bit with the dot com bubble? This is the kind of thing I'm hearing. And I've been terribly impressed in, in terms of responding to how technology is changing by this book. Now, there's much of this book by Ray Kurzweil that you, you might want to put to one side. He's talking about the integration and the collective impact of nanotechnology, robotics, genetics, and information technology, and looking to a world, as the subtitle suggests, when humans will actually transcend biology. Leaving that to one side, there's one component of the work that fascinates me. 
And I followed Kurt Stoddard's work uh, since the mid-80s when I was doing a doctorate in artificial intelligence and law. And I found many of his predictions in AI to be fascinating and always have done. What's interesting is his theory about the evolution of technology. And it's actually supported by a whole bunch of other people's thinking of technology. Many of you will know about Moore's Law, Gordon Moore in 1965. He developed this, this rule or law very approximately that every 18 months or two years, processing power would double in its cost would half. Um, and many people said that last for three or four years. It's still going strong, and most people who pay attention to this field see that all manner of investments in technology and all sorts of commercial imperatives will keep that one going for many, many years yet. What Kurzweil does is he looks at evolution of technology, not just in terms of processing power, the number of internet users, the number of transistors in the chip, uh, hard disk capacity, a whole bundle of different headings. And what he's suggesting, and in sync the detail doesn't matter, it's the thrust that's important. Far from Supporting lawyers' view that technology is tailing off, or this path leveling out, or perhaps even increasing steadily, he suggests there's going to be an exponential increase in the power of technology. And memorably, he says two things. He says by 2020, and again, there are others who agree with him, and even if it's not right, the general thrust is important. By 2020, if one follows Moore's law and other developments, the average desktop machine will, costing maybe about $1,000 in today's terms, will have the processing power of the average human brain. That's 10 to the 16th, 10 to the 17th calculations per second. He's not saying this machines will be artificial intelligence, just giving you a flavor of the increase in power. By 2050, if one follows the curve, the average desktop machine will have more processing power than all of humanity put together. Now, if you can see the day, or even discuss the day, that the average desktop machine will have more processing power than all of humanity put together, it might be time for lawyers to rethink some of their working practices. It seems to me absurd for the legal profession to think that all other sectors and all other markets will be radically transformed through technology and yet legal practice will remain much the same. Of course it won't happen, we're going to see transformations, and it's a few of these transformations I want to talk to you about. But just, get, just to give a flavor of something that's moved on so rapidly, the developments in broadly what I would call online community over the last few years. In communicating, instant messaging, over 100 million users. Blogging, I concede that of the 100 million people out there who blog, very few have anything worthwhile to say. But the important and interesting phenomenon, it seems to me, is that there are new ways of communicating, of collaborating, of communicating in mass, en masse, that we just inconceivable a small number of years ago. Mass collaboration itself, the formation, whether it be of, a, of an online encyclopedia like Wikipedia, or an operating system like Linux, this idea that people unmanaged, unfinanced, uh, unedited, as it were, can come together and create these remarkable artifacts, uh, challenge fundamental business thinking, and shows there's just a new world out there of communication with 1.25 billion people connected to one another. Strange things are going to happen. Social networking, Facebook, many people when they speak to students, dominates their social lives, but don't see the business dimension. But it seems to me entirely predictable, and far more predictable than email was in 96, that within a few years, Facebook-like technology will connect lawyers to their clients. And my job and my self-appointed to think, well, what if? What if that happened? What if all law firms and their clients were all on something like Facebook? How would that change the way that work was undertaken, the way that work was competed for, uh, the way in which services were delivered? I argue it would change it quite radically. Uh, and what about Twitter? I gave a conference recently in Chicago during which there were over 200 tweets as I spoke. Now, that wasn't there a few years ago. This emerging technology that allows people real time, whatever one thinks of it, to notify friends and contacts of what they're doing and what they're thinking. Again, what would it happen if two or three general counsel of the largest corporations in the world started tweeting and twittering all the time? What would that mean? How would law firms monitor that? Nonsensical, most law firms would say today, but as I say, wildly more predictable than email was in 96. And for those who are skeptical, I point to online pets. 220 million people, sorry, 150 million people have online pets. 70 million people have more than one online pet. And what's more or less likely, an online pet or an online lawyer, I ask you? <laughs> what does all of this mean for lawyers? I follow the, the thinking of Clayton Christensen, who's a professor at the business school here, where he distinguishes between sustaining and disruptive technologies. Sustaining technologies being those that sustain and support the way a particular business works and the way a particular market functions. Disruptive technologies are technologies that come around and fundamentally change or challenge a business, a market, a sector. And my belief is that the, we've seen over the last decade, for example, 
very great impact to sustaining technologies in law firms, whether it be accounting systems, word processing systems, electronic mail systems. They haven't fundamentally challenged the way lawyers work. The next decade for me will see the emergence of, I argue, 10 disruptive legal technologies. That's the main theme of my, my new book. I'm saying individually, these technologies are pretty fundamental. Together, they will entirely transform the legal landscape. Let me give an example of four, or give you four examples. Online or closed client communities. Have a look at Cerebro.com, S-E-R-M-O.com. That, when I last looked, it's probably changed, but it's 50,000 doctors in the United States. No pharmaceutical companies, no patients. 50,000 doctors online, exchanging ideas and thoughts and insights and experiences and medications and therapies on patients' conditions and so forth. A cross between Facebook and Wikipedia in many ways. What has been built up there is a massive resource insight into medical conditions. And I saw that and I thought, what if? What if that happened in the legal world? What if, and I thought, law firms, not a chance. Law firms are not going to come online and share and collaborate in this way. Clients, bingo. That is what's going to happen. Clients of law firms will come online and will share experiences. I think this is already happening. I can point you to 2003 when the Banking Legal Technology Group was set up in London. Nine investment banks asked five law, law firms to collaborate. They set up a close community with storage of know-how. This is not science fiction. It will happen. It's fundamentally disruptive for conventional law firms. If one client needs a multi-jurisdictional review of a particular area of law, why shouldn't these clients share the cost of that amongst one another? Traditionally, what would happen is a law firm would advise one client to do the review and think, oh, I'll do it for that firm and that, that client and that client and that client. That's called knowledge management, recycling your knowledge. The sharing of knowledge is going to happen at the market level soon amongst communities. Clients will say, I'd like you to do this work, but do know that I'm going to be sharing that with another 10 banks or another 10 pharmaceutical companies. You're not interested in doing it? We'll go to another firm. The world's changed. It's, it's now a buyer's market on legal services. Law firms will irresistibly be drawn as supporting online or close client community. Online dispute resolution. We have the, the world's leading specialist, Ethan Kept in the audience, who knows far more about this than I do. But this idea that we have of disputes that we physically congregate to get, together to settle our differences. Is court a service or a place, I always ask. Seems to me it could be a service. There's a whole bundle of techniques that allow people to resolve disputes with the support of technology and not necessarily congregating together in a traditional way. What about embedded legal knowledge? What do I mean by that? Imagine if you couldn't drive your car unless you had your seatbelt plugged in or inserted. Not that uh, there was a rule forbidding it, but that the car wouldn't start. The rule would be embedded in the system. When you play solitaire, as I'm sure we've all done on our personal computers, you know, the card game, if you want, if you try to put a red five under a red six, it unceremoniously flicks the card back to the file again. When we used to play with atoms, with cards, I don't know why you want to do this, but you could do it. You could put the red five under the red six. Uh, you might get into difficulties later on, but you could do it. You could break the rules. In the, in the electronic version, you can't break the rules. The rules are embedded in the system. And looking ahead, I see great potential for the embedding of law in project management, business management, systems, and so forth, and processes and organizations. That this idea you have to look at what you're doing and evaluate it from a legal point of view, apply the law to it, will actually become rather bizarre. Legal compliance will be built in to the way we run our businesses, the way we run our life. Like the car game, it won't be, it won't be an option to put the red five under the red six. And again, that embodiment of legal knowledge within organizations and their processes and their systems will actually be disruptive for law firms who used to be the people who advised on compliance. Compliance will be an embedded process. What about the electronic legal marketplace? We're all familiar with eBay and the auctioning of, of goods through eBay. We're all familiar with reputation systems where you can go on and find out what other people thought of a hotel. We're all familiar with price comparison systems. You can find out whether or not one insurance company is cheaper than another. Why should the legal market be immune from these very same techniques? That's the electronic legal marketplace. I can point you to examples of each, but very soon they'll be commonplace. Options for legal services, strong reputation systems online, price comparison. Uh, this the asymmetry of information uh, as between client and provider will disappear. It'll be far easier for clients to find out what legal services are available at the lowest cost and what reputation is attached. That will transform and again be highly disruptive for law firms who in many ways have relied in the past on not being able to know, uh, or for clients not being able to know what alternatives were available. The shape of law firms are going to change. 
the classic shape, this triangle, the expert trusted advisor at the top, with the routine work being done by junior lawyers below. This is the fundamental, the gearing, the levering, the fundamental model that gives rise to profitability of law firms. The more junior lawyers, the more profitable the firm by and large. You have many junior lawyers who are paid, but actually earn far more for the firm. And that is actually swept off as profit. What the thrust of what I've had to say today is there's new ways of sourcing that routine work. We don't need expensive junior lawyers in expensive buildings, in expensive cities, doing that routine legal work. And what will happen, therefore, I believe, is that traditional triangle actually very much narrow in the way you'll see this slide before you. That's a fundamental challenge to profitability to the business model underpinning almost every law firm over the size of the 50 lawyers in this country. What about access to law and justice? In England, just as a case study, one million, and we're far smaller country than we are, they're 50 year size, one million civil problems go unresolved each year. Huge latent market, people who want legal advice, who benefit from legal guidance but can't afford it today. The Ministry of Justice econ economists did some research which suggested that indeed this unresolved legal civil problem phenomena, phenomenon cost the taxpayer and these people over 13 billion pounds over a three and a half year period. What we have in England and in Wales and in many other jurisdictions, I'm afraid, the very well off or the state supported receive a Rolls Royce service while frankly most people are walking. That's not access to justice. It cannot be that the primary means of social control is actually not available to most of us. There's internet based solutions that will at least help there. There's online document assembly. There's online legal advice. There's the open sourcing of legal materials which actually can be shared with one another. There's communities of experience. And I, I'm very keen on this idea that uh, when one citizen has sorted out perhaps their boundary dispute, they'll go online and record their experiences. Because very often it's more convenient and less forbidding for the average citizen to speak to someone else, another citizen who's gone through a legal problem and be tracked through how they sort it out rather than meeting a lawyer. So this huge body, I believe, communities of legal experience will build up. Is that unlikely? We'll look at so many other areas, whether it be reputations of hotels, whether it be insight into how to sort out your latest PC problem. In the online communities we're building up, there does seem a community spirit which is encouraging people to record their thoughts and in turn for people to actually benefit from that. But frequently asked questions, flowchart, decision trees, why can't we use these tools to offer a clear navigation through complex law? In all of this, remember Voltaire, the best is the enemy of the good. Every lawyer will tend to say, that's not as good as the service a proper lawyer provides. That might be right, but proper lawyers aren't in practice available to most people, to most citizens, to, to most small and medium-sized businesses. We have to find new ways of delivering legal service. So what then is the future for lawyers? The big question I ask and say it must be asked is what parts of lawyers' work can be undertaken differently? This is just fundamental. What parts of lawyers' work can be undertaken differently? by which I mean more quickly, cheaply, efficiently, or to a higher quality, using alternative methods of working. That's the question. Put your hand in your heart, look at what you do, decompose it into chunks, could that be done differently? And even if you as a lawyer think, I don't want to do it that way because it won't be profitable, if you can identify a way that it can be done differently, I believe the market will find ways for it to be done differently. And what we're seeing, I think, is the market doing its stuff across the law. We want to see new ways of delivering legal services. What used to be conventionally at the heart of the law firm will actually be sourced in different ways. Jack Welsh, in, uh, in the beginning of the dot com period, apparently he brought together, he says in his book, uh, all his leading executives and said, I've looked at Amazon and I've looked at what it's done to book selling. And I want you to look at your individual businesses and see the way the internet might do to these businesses what Amazon is doing to conventional bookshops. And if you can see these ways, he said, then we've got to defend ourselves against that. He called that, um, two weeks later, he called that growyourbusiness.com. At the time, he called it destroyyourbusiness.com. Find ways that someone else can destroy the business, defend it. Two weeks later, growyourbusiness.com. His mindset shifted in a fortnight because he thought, wrong idea. If we can see ways that other people could deliver that service through the internet, we should be delivering service in that way. And I say the same to lawyers. It's not destroy your business, it's grow your business. If you can see ways that your service might be delivered, be entrepreneurial, be creative. You should be delivering it in that way. So for what will lawyers be needed more fundamentally? Once greater efficiency is imposed, when clients have online resources, and if in-house departments can collaborate with one another, 
What's the conventional lawyer needed for? I think the answer is two things. Where deep expertise is required, firstly, or secondly, where complex intercommunication between human beings is required. Now, when I speak to most lawyers, I see a collective relaxation of shoulders when the slide goes down. So that's me. I have deep expertise, and my communication is invariably complex. Well, not so fast is my view. Complexity can be modeled. If I learned anything through the 80s of my work in AI and law, is that legal expertise is at least of two sorts. Sometimes legal expertise is nothing more than complex bodies of rules. That's what Deloitte showed through their tax system. The fact that it's quite hard to get your head around, that actually often means a computer can metaphorically get its head around it. It can offer the path through this complex body of rules. A different sort of expertise is where creativity, judgment, uh, experience is required. Um, and I think it is terribly difficult often to model that by technology, but that's often exaggerated. If we're really honest, many of say, well, that requires its intuition, knee jerk, uh, gut reaction. Uh, but often underpinning expert behavior is consistency and stuff that can be modeled. So I think it was Edison said that uh, genius is 99% perspiration, only 1% inspiration. I think it's true of an inventor like him, it's probably true of corporate lawyers as well. We exaggerate the extent to which creativity uh, um, is required very often. And as for complex communication, the reality is, if you speak to many law firms, direct face-to-face -face contact diminishing in many areas anyway. Electronic mail, video conferencing, in due course social networking, I have no doubt. You can speak to many senior junior lawyers, by which I mean maybe associates, quite senior associates in, uh, we're not partners in law firms, uh, who yet are doing huge amounts of valuable client work. They never see the client. Do they really need to be, as I keep on saying, in expensive buildings and expensive cities? And more than that, the next generation might feel differently. We cannot claim, because our generation of lawyers has successfully conducted work on a face-to-face -face basis, that that should bind future generations. If the Facebook generation, the net generation, as I define them, people who can't remember a free internet world, if they think the idea of getting together physically to pass along legal advice is bizarre, we can't say, no, no, that's the way we've always done it. It has to continue in that way. So I, the argument that complex communication, my clients really want to look me in the eyeballs. Well, actually, many of them don't want to look you in the eyeballs. They prefer to pay half the price and receive an email from you. And that's the reality that many lawyers have to face. Future job for lawyers, it's another talk, but just to give a flavor, is the expert trusted advisor, a variation of a current theme, but it's a more sophisticated beast. The legal knowledge engineer, who actually builds all these knowledge systems I'm talking about, that requires legal skill and knowledge. It's not what you expect, to, uh, or you expect when you're training as a lawyer in law school, but that'll be a right to a legal job in the future. The hybrids, those people who are half a psychologist, half an economist, uh, and many other skills, uh, brought together, legal service won't be delivered purely as black letter law advice. It'll be, I believe, synthesized and presented as a broader package. The legal project manager, the people who actually identify and oversee the decomposing of legal work and it's farming out, it's bringing together in the assembly line manner I'm anticipating. Or the legal risk manager, this fundamental role that actually has not really been invented yet, but this is what clients are wanting. These are different jobs. So when I'm talking with the end of lawyers question mark, it's the end of, to some extent, the traditional one-to-one -one consultative advisory role. It won't diminish altogether, where, where deep expertise is required or where complex communication is needed, there'll still be a job, but that role will diminish considerably. What about law schools finally, just for a couple of minutes? Big question here, what are we training young lawyers to become? If I'm even slightly correct, the curricula of most law schools, at, at least the very least, has some serious gaps. Are we training our lawyers to become traditional one-to-one, face-to-face -to -face consultative advisors who specialize in individual jurisdictions? I think in English law schools, yes, that's what we're doing. That's what we're training our lawyers to become. Or are we training our lawyers to be more flexible, team-based professionals, able to transcend legal boundaries, and willing to draw on modern techniques? I don't think we are, if we're really honest with ourselves. In most UK law schools, the law is taught as it, as it was taught in the 1970s. I started law school in 1978. I'm still teaching law schools. It's the same basic model. All of what I'm talking about, when I speak to and have spoken to some of the leading academics, I'm considered to be an interesting sideshow. When I advise the leading law firms in the world, they're saying, why are law schools not preparing lawyers, or at least forewarning them, of the world that is, never mind what the world that might be? Law schools focus on legal problem solving. Not all of them, and I would speak for England, but most of them focus on legal problems solving, legal reasoning, legal techniques that dominated in the 70s. 
I'm not even presenting a picture of the world today. I'm presenting a picture of the world many years ahead. The world today, when I speak to these major law firms, they say that many of the students have, when they arrive in day one, are surprised at what's going on. It seems to me I'm a great believer of much legal studies to teach uh, jurisprudence in Oxford. I, 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 in my heart, I'm a legal philosopher. I wouldn't for a second say you don't teach fundamental legal subjects. Is it not incumbent on us in some way, as people involved in the teaching of law, to give some sense of what the world is today and what it might be in the future? We teach today with very little regard for globalization, for commoditization, for information technology, for modern business management from law, for alternative sourcing of legal work. None of that in most law schools across the world is reflected on the curriculum. Most law graduates in England are ill-prepared for work, as I say, in major international firms. So the question I, I finish with is this. Should we extend the remit of law school to include other disciplines, such as risk management, project management, legal knowledge management, disruptive legal technologies? These are just some examples. Then many traditional law professors will say the curriculum's already busy enough. But I can't help feeling that at least the opportunity should be there for bright, imaginative students who are interested in the next generation of lawyering to get some glimpse of what the future might look like. And it's that glimpse I've tried to offer today. Thank you. I think it's a danger rather than I think you, you're too firm with me in saying that, that actually it does restrict uh, discussion and evaluation uh, of the law. I think a lot depends on the culture that we develop around embedding the law. I don't think, for example, if your car doesn't start because uh, there's some device that prevents it from starting because the seatbelt's not uh, inserted. I don't think that should discourage you from thinking I wonder if this is a good thing. I don't think in the card game it should discourage discussion and debate. Uh, I can a lot will depend on, uh, as I say, the culture and um, the environment that we create around debates about changes in our systems. There will be changes in our systems rather than changes in our law. Uh, and a lot will depend on how explicitly we also record the law. The danger, I, I think I, I, I agree with you, is the danger if one embeds the law without articulating the law, so people actually don't know uh, what to what it is they're, they're subject. They just know that certain courses of action seem not open to them. So, in parallel with embedding, one needs to expressly articulate the law and document the law. It's a different world altogether. I'm not saying I've cracked how we'll implement that. I'm just saying that's one way we can achieve it. But you're absolutely right to point to the danger that in embedding law, you potentially conceal law and you potentially discourage evaluation and change of the law. Kevin. In the uh, systematizing, it's important people are just far more pragmatic about it. Um, and uh, I, I suspect it's underlying this, they're thinking, well, when, when junior lawyers are faced with problems, they too often might miss uh, issues that are of greater complexity than, than, than 
in a robot from the face of it in the system of two by face. So they actually have, there's, in the systems, in the best systems I've seen, there are physical audit trails that people can, can actually, I'm not talking any particular system here, but if I look collectively all the systems I've seen, the best ones have audit trails where there's actually human supervision and review. So it's not a question of shoving the, the information in, out comes the answer, and there's no human intervention. There is a sufficiently rich audit trail that uh, there's an opportunity for human experts to see what. Now, I'll say, just when just, uh, an alarm bell rings in your mind, alarm bells don't often ring in computer systems, minds, as it were. So I think the important thing is there's opportunity for human intervention and review. Uh, but I do think this is a, just to be pragmatic about it, that uh, we will develop systems that will make mistakes. Uh, I suppose we need to balance that against the use of human beings who do, do make mistakes. And then we have to think what checks and balances we, we put in place. What I also do find is that um, often these kind of systems are preparing first drafts as it were, not final drafts. So it's taking a production process that needs to be undertaken, that used to need to be handcrafted, uh, that is then actually poured over by experts, but it's actually just taking a lot of the cost or the part of complexity out of a phase one of a project. Sir? Uh, I'm from an I worked at the Japanese law firm and uh, as a, a junior associate, and uh, yeah. I just uh, um, the, looked up on my experience, you know, working for like, capital markets transactions. There are many of them, uh, the standard, I mean, ma many of the uh, contracts and work are, you know, are uh, the, uh, like, uh, the, the common features and uh, could be standardized. But the one obstacle in doing that kind of uh, standardization was the systemization, but uh, you know, how to charge that kind of uh, systemization or standardization, you need to make a kind of initial upfront investment to, to do some kind of standardization, like making a, a system or you know, collecting all the information and data transactions. But uh, you know, upfront, you need to do some uh, investment. And, uh, how, I mean, and how, I mean, you don't know, you know how many transactions are come that you can copy. And, uh, like, 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 for example, if, if you have a Transactions, you can charge one tenth of the total investment for the first transaction that can come up with investment, but you don't know. And uh, I think that's one of the things that might deter law firms from making yeah. that kind of uh, investment and try to speak to the you know, bespoke. Yeah. Well, what you're saying is there's a disincentive for a variety of reasons to standardize. And, uh, and the incentive to read and bespoke is it's, uh, it's, it's frankly, it gives rise to a lot of money. It's done on an hourly really basis. There's no upfront investment and, uh, and so forth. Just turning around the other way, uh, I think the market's going to require standardization and problems will have to respond. So I think when we look at, say, the, the construction and engineering world, FIDIC, the standard form contract, which has standardized much uh, of uh, uh, the, the contracting and negotiating that area, if you look at the area of derivatives, there is the standard bonds and so forth. I think sophisticated market will create their own standards. But just going specifically to your, your point, isn't this quite like the product development challenge that almost every normal business faces? That you think we're developing something new, uh, and we actually have to say how much is that front investment, how what do we imagine the market will be, and then we need to cost it accordingly. I think, and I haven't touched on this, but I think uh, law firms are going to have to have a more R and D uh, uh, mentality. So if you take someone like a, a consumer electronic or pharmaceutical company, fascinatingly, uh, Apple or Sony do not know the products in five years' time that will be making them money. They don't exist yet. So what they do, there's lots of clever people in R&D who come up with ideas, and they made the decision. They say, well, is there a market for that? It's going to cost us 50 million to develop. How many do they sell? They make the business case. And this is why law firms, uh, I mean, we'll look back on it, I think, I think it's remarkable that lawyers just carried on for 20 or 30 years doing the same thing. Lawyers are actually going to have to become more entrepreneurial. They're going to have to make out business cases. They're going to have to invest in R&D. They're going to have to join the market as it were. But what do you see as a tipping point uh, when the law firm is going to make that structure or change from you know, this book of work to, to more you know, R&D based right, initial? For me, it's all about the clients. It's when, the, as I say, we're moving to a large market. It's when the general counsel, in-house lawyers, um, actually are starting to be more demanding. And I've got a record before, I'm amazed that uh, in-house lawyers aren't firmer with law firms. It just amazes me how profitable Congratulations, how profitable some external law firms are, and yet clients are saying we're spending too much on legal fees. How could it be that law firms are increasing their profitability maybe 15, 20% per year, and clients aren't putting their foot down? Now, the reality is there used to be more work uh, 
uh, around, uh, it was basically uh, a seller's market, moving to a buyer's market, so it would be driven by the, the, the clients. Um, just, a, just a couple of more questions because we're going to need to break soon, but we'll take okay. at least a few more. Thank you. Um, several times you mentioned knowledge, representation, reasoning systems, coming jobs, legal knowledge, engineers, and so forth. Yeah. And you mentioned uh, the semantic web, and I just wondered if you'd like to make some more remarks about the semantic web components, ontologies, XML. I thought I didn't mention semantic web, and it's uh, in my book. It's, uh, it's something I mentioned. I think a lot more work needs to be done on. I know we've been working the AI and community precisely on this, because I, I mean, the the reality is that there are limitations. You know, we've noticed for years on, on uh, many of the conventional, purely rule-based approaches to to legal problems. Well, I, mean, I see this as a uh, I, in many ways, I, I mean, just very quickly, but during the 80s, I devoted my life to expert systems in law. That, and, and, uh, and I used to say that there were two ways you could define it. You could define these systems um, architecturally in terms of the types of techniques you use, rule based systems, or semantic or whatever they were at the time. Or, or I said you could define them functionally. And my functional definition was that these were systems that made scarce expertise, scarce expertise, legal expertise, and knowledge more widely available and more easily accessible. And that, as a kind of quite pragmatic, not so scholarly guy, was my was my perspective. I want to develop computer systems that make safe expertise, legal knowledge, more widely available, more easily accessible. X years on, uh, 20 years on, still doing that. It's just the enabling technologies have changed. Whether or not one wants to call that AI and all expert systems and all, I don't know. But a lot of the work I do is about helping law firms to make scarce expertise and knowledge more widely available, more easily accessible. Uh, online. Legal guidance systems, I would call them quite innocuously, uh, um, I think, embody that same kind of spirit. But the reality is, they're still pretty crude. In terms of legal problem solving, legal advice giving, we need more powerful toolkits. That's why I think we, we need to move to richer representations of legal meaning rather than a quite high level uh, rule. The fact that we're not involved in it doesn't mean I don't think it's important. It's just it's not my uh, field anymore. One more question, shall we say? Uh, well, we've got two here. Why don't we take them? Okay, fine. Uh, probably separately. Right. That was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm wondering who's going to win in this new world because often when a new disruptive technology comes along, it's not the incumbents. Mm -hmm. You've been talking about law firms, and I'm wondering, is that going? Is our law firms going to be where the innovation is going to happen? Is there going to be? Is there going to be something else? Is it going to happen in a different market segment than the the big Fortune 500 companies? Is it instead maybe going to target middle class or, or upper middle middle class consumers rather than? the big firms because of this tendency to, to for stasis, and in particular given that here in the States where we don't have that same ability to have external investments, is it possible that it just kind of won't happen in that it will just be overrun, will be overrun with British um, rather than American? <laughs> 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 so, I would like to find what you said. I think it's not just the case that sometimes incumbents uh, don't like to do Most of the research suggests incumbents almost always fail with disruptive technology because uh, uh, if you're a market leader, uh, I mean, the phrase I always use when I speak to law firms historically has been uh, how can you convince a room full of millionaires that we've got the business model wrong? That's the, the historical context. Law firms have done tremendously well. For 20 years, other than one or two years, the, uh, the good firms have increased the profitability by at least, or turnover at least by 10% each year. Uh, some of me standing up and saying the legal world is about to change rapidly, uh, again, like the academics, it's an interesting sideshow rather than something fundamentally strategic. The catalyst of the change, I believe, is the, is the economic difficulties because we actually are seeing that the clients are under fundamental pressure. Uh, my rough guess is that if you take, say, the top 100 law firms in England or perhaps in the US, a third will probably streamline, re engineer, and come through. I mean, with the investment, the kind of technology and techniques I'm talking about, come through very strongly indeed. And two thirds, I think, will suffer and decline. And I think to replace the two thirds, not entirely because they won't go out of business, although some of them will. Then you will actually see new service providers. Uh, now, whether or not, as I said earlier, whether or not you yourselves uh, put external investment in your business is, I think, by the way, because I think that the multi sourcing models will allow imaginative US businesses to source new services uh, uh, from a whole variety of different providers. I don't think there's enough uh, British either expertise or innovation to, to swamp the US market, so I wouldn't worry on that front. Final question. I was actually going to ask the, the books and the patients as well. Okay. Thank you guys so much for all of you. So, okay. Well, which thank you. Many, many thanks. Um,